terrible name for a book of the Bible. Numbers is it. Who wants to read a book about numbers? Um, but its name in Hebrew is not numbers. Its name in Hebrew is Bamidbar. Bamidbar means in the wilderness. Now, that's a great name for a book. I'm going to read that one. Because the, the, it starts out in Hebrew, Vaidabar Adonai El Moshi, Bamidbar Sinai. And Adonai spoke to Moses, Bamidbar, in the wilderness of Sinai. Now, unless you are still a slave in Egypt, you've got wilderness experience. But if you've been passed from death to life, from slavery to freedom, then you've spent time in the wilderness, and you may be in the wilderness even as we speak. But the goal is to leave Egypt and to arrive in Canaan. And to get from the one to the other, God has ordained that we go through the detour of the wilderness. It's just part of how he does things. But here's the interesting thing, and make sure you get hold of this. In some areas of your life, you may still be a slave in Egypt. In some areas of your life, you may already be experiencing the fruitfulness of Canaan. But probably in a lot of areas, if not most areas of your life, you're still in the wilderness. You're still in this transition period. Can you, can you identify with what I'm saying? I know there are some areas of my life, I, I think I'm free indeed. And God says, well, almost. And then he reveals an area like, oh, that's still back there in Egypt. And um, it has to be brought out. And it's in the wilderness that a number of things happen. Israel is tested. But the Torah is given. The miraculous is seen in very open ways. God's hand is very evident. And, uh, but this wilderness period is not necessarily, ple necessarily pleasant. And, uh, oh my, there we go. <laughs> yeah, there, we have a buzz in the, in the lights or something. Okay, well, does that bother you? So... So as we go through this book of Numbers, the first thing we find in the first two chapters is God takes a census. Now, God had taken a census already a couple of times. The first census was back in Exodus 12 when the Israelites leave Egypt. Now, it's not called a census there, but it was a counting. And it says there in Exodus 12, I think it's verse around verse 37, um, it says, and I just lost my notes. Here they are. It says there that, um, yeah, 1237, and the people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot, about, about 600,000 men on foot, about, roundabout. You see, when the Israelites left Egypt, it was a mob. It was chaotic. There was no organization. All they knew is they wanted Egypt in the rearview mirror, and they left. They didn't have a very clear idea of where they were going or how to get there. They were unprepared. I mean, they didn't even uh, have time to let their dough rise, and so they had to eat matzah. And, uh, but that was okay. They were just, let's get out of Dodge. Let's get out of here. And they did. But now, over a year later, as they've been camped around Mount Sinai, and God has given his tour, and he's spoken his truth into their lives, now we see such order. We see such order. It's the, the tribes are arranged in groups of three. Three on the east, three in the south, three in the west, three in the north. The, the Levites are broken up into three main groups. One group on the south, one on the west, one on the north. They're, they're in rows. They're in lines. It's, it's beautiful. It's organized. It's brilliant. Now, as I was saying earlier, some people... Um, don't think this is what being led by the Spirit looks like. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? They get all the parts of the tabernacle made. It's time to put together. And so Moses says, all right, everybody, put it together. Just be led by the Spirit. Just follow the Spirit. Can you imagine the chaos? You'd have the thing inside out, upside down, and backwards, and you'd have the, the, the altar inside the Holy of Holies, and you'd have the, 
the Ark of the Covenant, you know, walking around the outside. Who knows what it would be like? And when it came time to take it down and move it, can you imagine Moses said, just be led by the Spirit, just follow the Spirit. Total chaos. There would never be a tabernacle. They'd start putting it together. Where's this curtain? Where, where's this curtain that goes here? We can't have it done without this one curtain. Oh, Shmuley, he, he, he's carrying the curtain and he sprained his ankle. He'll be in here about noon tomorrow. He's late arriving. Can you imagine? On the other hand, man can come in with his own human reasoning and he can impose order, a man-made order, and enforce it from the outside in and there's no leading of the Spirit whatsoever. What I want us to understand is that following God's Torah, obeying His orders, and following the Spirit, being inspired by the Spirit, are not in any way contradictory. They are complementary. Absolutely complementary. If you were here earlier while we were reading Ruth, I introduced it with some remarks. You know, tomorrow is Shavuot. Tomorrow, or I should say tonight at sundown, begins the day of Pentecost. Today is the 49th day after Passover. We count the Omer. Today is day 49. And then at sundown, Pentecost arrives. And at the very first Pentecost, Israel received the Torah from God at Mount Sinai. And I mentioned that last year when Caleb and I and Ben and and, uh, my nephew Daniel, when we were in Israel, we were in Jerusalem for Pentecost. And what, what a party that was. At sundown, Pentecost came. Shavuot descended. And the courtyard in front of the western wall was packed with thousands and thousands of worshipers. And he saw Jewish men dancing together, holding Torah scrolls and dancing around and singing and chanting, praying at the wall and coming back and talking and laughing and eating and dancing. And, and it was just amazing. And then they would go to the study halls off and on. And they would study Torah all night long. When they started getting tired, they'd come back to the wall and dance some more and eat some more. It went on all night long. All that night, all the next day. Because they did not see the Torah as a burden. They didn't see it as something heavy. Some heavy-handed thing. Because we know that God's yoke is light. His, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. And Moses in Deuteronomy says, you can see this Torah. It's not difficult. It's not far away. It's close. It's right in your lips. This is to, given to you to make life flow. To make it a blessing. To make it as easy as it can be. So the Torah was a joy. Well, then you fast forward, you know, about, uh, about 1,500 years, and you're at Acts chapter 2. So you picture the temple. Jewish people from all over the known world had come in. And they're dancing, they're singing, they're rejoicing, they're eating in the temple. They're having a wonderful time celebrating the giving of the Torah. But this time, God adds to the joy. Because there's this cluster of apostles and Wives and family and friends and disciples of Messiah. And all of a sudden, that first Shavuot happens over again. Instead of the flame being on the mountain, now it's resting on the heads of his apostles. And the wind that was at the mountain and, the, and all that, it, now it's blowing right around them inside the temple. And the, the, the mission, I'm sorry, the, um, the Midrash Rabbah and the Talmud tell us that at Sinai, that great mixed multitude, they all heard God speak from Mount Sinai in their own language. And now this mixed multitude of, of people from around the known world who had come to Jerusalem for Shavuot, they all hear the apostles speaking in their own language. Is this replacing that? Absolutely not. This is complementing that. God had given his Torah. Now he's putting gas in the tank so you can really drive this thing. You can see what this puppy can do now. Right? One does not replace the other. And uh, they complement one another. And uh, the one fills the other and it, it empowers it and makes it a glorious and a wonderful thing. Now, 
when, when God sets up the, the camps around the tabernacle, I'm not going to take time to read the first two chapters. Hopefully you've been reading the Torah portion. Imagine the, the mob that came out of, uh, of Egypt and now the orderliness. But how did God do this? He brought it about by separation. We think of separation as being a bad thing, and oftentimes it is. But without separation, there can never be real unity. After all, the sword of the Spirit is a sword, it, and a sword's entire purpose for existence is to separate. All right? And when we look at the creation of the world, what did God do the first three days? First day, he separates light and darkness. Second day, he separates the waters above from waters below. The third day, he separates the dry land from the seas. Then on, th that set the, 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 uh, the foundation, so in days four, five, and six, he can fill these things. The light and the darkness he separated on day one, then on day four, he prepares vessels for that light. The sun to rule the day, and the moon to rule the night. The second day, he separated the waters above from waters below. So on the fifth day, what does he do? The waters above, the, the atmospheres, he makes the birds, and he makes the fish on that day. The third day, he separates the land from the, from the seas, makes the dry land appear, and then the vegetation begins to grow there. So what does he do on the sixth day? He creates the animals that feed on that herbage on the, and live on that dry land. And he creates man to oversee the animals and the garden and the, the agriculture. You understand? Don't look at division as a bad thing. Don't, or I should say, don't always look at it as a bad thing. Because order can only come about through separation. I always give the example of a messy bedroom. You know, if you have kids, you know what a messy bedroom looks like. So you tell them to clean their bedroom. What do they do? They separate. The dirty clothes go there. The clean ones get folded up and put here. The toys go in the box. The books go on the shelf. You separate things up where they belong, and then, ah, oh, it's beautiful. It's orderly. Now there's room to move. So God brought separation. He had the people camp in their tribes, their family groups. And then he put three family groups to the east, to Judah and two, two tribes with him. And on the south, he puts three. And then he has them separated according to, to their banners. And he says there in chapter 1, in verse 52, The children of Israel shall encamp, every man at his camp. Every man at his banner, according to their legions. Sometimes we don't like the banner we're given, or the family we're put in, or the tribe, or the appointment we're given. But I'm telling you, when you're at the place you're supposed to be, you excel. Because God created you for good works in Christ Jesus, the word tells us. And when you're doing the good works he's given you to do, all the pistons are firing and life flows. Don't envy someone else their job. You'll never be able to do it. You can do the job God gives you. And only you can do it as well as you can do it because you were created to do it. All right? So do the thing God's given you to do. I had a conversation with, uh, with John Burns yesterday, and we were talking, and, and, and we were talking about discovering your purpose in life. And I don't really think it's something we're supposed to spend a lot of time on myself. I know that sounds shocking, but I don't think your, your job is to, what is the big purpose God has for me? Your job in life is to live the next five minutes according to God's word, depending upon him to give you the, the, the guidance and the strength to do it. Five minutes at a time. Do the thing at hand. Be faithful in that which is small, then God can entrust you with big things. And the example I was thinking of is Billy Graham. We all think, Billy Graham, you know, God, are you calling me to Billy, be a Billy Graham? You know, and to, to you know, influence the world for you? Probably not. But see, whenever I think of him, Billy Graham, this godly man, who's impacted the world in a powerful way, I want to know about the man who led Billy Graham to the Lord. 
the one who shared the good news of Messiah with Billy Graham. I don't even know his name. Who was he? He was some nobody. Just a guy. Just living his life five minutes at a time. And somewhere along the line, there's an encounter with this young man. And this guy does what he does. He shares the truth of Messiah with him. Just a little thing. A little daily thing. No big deal. And yet, without that man, would we have had a Billy Graham? Which job's more important? Which one gets more glory? Billy Graham for leading these crusades and bringing hundreds of thousands of people to faith? Or the one man who brought Billy Graham to faith? If this one man was doing what God called him to do, and Billy Graham is doing what God called him to do, as far as I'm concerned, the rewards are the same. We just need to quit looking at things from man's point of view and look at things from God's point of view. And as I said earlier during the reading of Ruth, the secret to spiritual power is smallness and anonymity. It's just little things that God uses to accomplish big things. Big things often or a sign of infection. Giantism usually precedes collapse. Whether it's a star or whether it's a, a toe or a finger that swells up with infection before it falls off, or whether it's a, a nation like Greece or Rome or Egypt, it reaches this point of giantism and then it can't support itself and just it's gone. You know, here's Messiah, a carpenter who lives in this little <laughs> little country of Israel in a no-name town, Nazareth. And he's 30 years old. He starts calling some men to follow him. He never writes a book. He just pours his life in 12 men. One of them was a washout. So these 11 men turned the entire world upside down. He focused on the thing at hand. You see that? So, God has, has given us Torah. He's divided the people into their functions, into their camps, into their groups, under their banners. And it's a beautiful thing. We have an eyewitness account of this. It's in Numbers chapter 24. This is uh, Balaam, the false prophet Balaam. He was hired by Balak to curse Israel, Right? And so he's up on this mountain, he's looking down upon the camp of Israel. And then out of his words, out of his mouth come these words. Numbers 24, verses 5 and 6. Ma tovu Yaakov. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob. Your encampments, O Israel. How lovely. They're beautiful. Look at this. The order, the precision, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. Like palm groves that stretch afar, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that Adonai has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. Balaam, the false prophet, speaking under the inspiration of God, he's overwhelmed by the beauty of this. But the first thing that happens is the coming of the Torah. The internalizing of the Torah. Bringing God's word, which is exterior to you, and bring it inside of you and obeying it. And then what happens is on the outside, order and symmetry and balance is the fruit. Too many times I've been part of a church where they thought, now if we can just get everything in order, get everybody sorted out, get programs for each group, and we'll have a, a program for each age group for every possible dysfunction a person experience. We'll have a group for that. And we'll have this and that and this program. That, we'll get it all organized. And it'll just be this wonderful, godly outflowing of the Spirit. It doesn't work that way. What you wind up with is this beautiful sepulcher that's just dead inside. You understand? So. Now I want us to look at this symmetry a little bit more. And I'm going to ask you a question. How many times, how many times were the firstborn in Israel redeemed? How many times? How many times were the firstborn sons, the Israelite firstborn sons, redeemed? 
once, right? Oh, my goodness, I got a work cut out for me. <laughs> they, <laughs> they were redeemed the first time in Egypt, right? The tenth plague, God uh, is, is coming through uh, as the angel of death. He's coming through Egypt. He's going to kill all the firstborn of men and of cattle. And the way you get to sidestep this death is you take the Passover lamb, you watch it for four days, and the fourth day between the evenings you kill it, you put its blood on the doorpost and the lintel uh, on the outside of the house, you take the body of the lamb inside, you roast it over fire, you eat it. And God says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. In other words, instead of your firstborn son dying, this lamb has died instead. And of course, the lamb's a picture of who? Yeshua, who was crucified on Passover day. The blood of the lamb passed the people from death to life because God saw it on their doors. The body of the lamb passed them from slavery to freedom because they ate it. They had strength to march out of Egypt the next morning. Got it? That was the first redemption of the firstborn. But in this Torah portion, if you had read it, tells us about the second redemption of the firstborn. Uh, go to um, go to uh, chapter three. And let's pick it up in um, in verse 11. Adonai spoke to Moses saying, Behold, I have taken the Levites, the tribe of Levi, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel in place of every firstborn, the first issue of every, room, every womb among the children of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine. For every firstborn is mine. On the day I struck down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified every firstborn in Israel for myself, from man to beast. They shall be mine. I am Adonai. So then he commands that there should be a census of the Levites from one month of age and up. They number them and they find, as you go over to chapter or verse 39 now, it says, all the countings of the Levites, which Moses and Aaron counted by the word of Adonai, according to their families, every male from one month of age and up were 22,000, 22,000. Adonai said to Moses, count every firstborn male of the children of Israel from one month of age and up and take a census of their names. You shall take the Levites for me, I, Adonai, in place of every firstborn of the children of Israel, and the livestock of the Levites, in place of every firstborn of the animals of the children of Israel. Moses counted, as Adonai had commanded him, every firstborn of the children of Israel, every firstborn male, according to the number of their names, from one month of age and up, according to their numbers, was 22,273. All right, you following the math here? How many firstborn uh, Le I mean, how many Levites were there? Levite men from one month and eight, up? 22,000. 22,000 males from one month of age and up. And then he counts all the firstborn of the rest of the tribes of Israel. Just the firstborn. So if you and your, your spouse have five sons, you just count the first one. He's the firstborn. So how many firstborn in Israel? 22,000. 273. You got 273 more firstborn in Israel than you have Levites to cover for them. So what's to be done? Verse 44, Adonai spoke to Moses saying, take the Levites in place of every firstborn of the children of Israel and the livestock of the Levites in place of their livestock. And the Levites shall be mine, I am Adonai. And as for the redemptions of the 273 of the firstborn of the children of Israel who were in excess of the Levites, you shall take five shekels each according to the head count. And the sacred shekel shall you take. The shekel is 20 geras. You shall give the money to Aaron and his sons as redemptions of the additional ones among them. Moses took the money of the redemption from those who were in excess 
of the redemptions of the Levites. From the firstborn of the children of Israel, he took the money, 1,365 in the sacred shekels. Moses gave the money of the redemptions to Aaron and his sons, according to the word of Adonai, as Adonai commanded Moses. Now, this should be raising some questions. Why are the firstborn of Israel redeemed twice? Once in Egypt, and now once at Mount Sinai. Once with the blood of a lamb, and now with the living son of a Levite. See, whenever you see these things, you're supposed to make these connections. It makes a menorah pattern. So it opens up, and the one account, the other account, go together to give you twice the light. All right? So, let's take a look at this. First redemption, second redemption. First redemption occurs in Egypt. The second redemption occurs at Sinai. Now, something very important about this Torah portion. Let me insert this. This Torah portion, Bamidbar, the opening of the book of Numbers, is always read on the Sabbath before Pentecost. The Sabbath before Shavuot. There's a supernatural and ordained timing to this reading. As it's scheduled out, it always arrives on the Sabbath before Shavuot. Today is the Sabbath. At sundown starts Shavuot. Because this Torah portion is intimately connected to the whole story of the 49 days between Passover and Shavuot. Now you have to remember, all of the Moedim, all of the holy days that God gives, he gives the month and the day that is to be observed. Month and day, month and day, month and day, except Shavuot. He doesn't give a month and a day. He says you take Passover, which is on the 14th of Nisan, and then you count 49 days, seven weeks, seven sevens. That's what Shavuot means. It's plural for the word seven. You count seven sevens. And then the next day is Shavuot. So Shavuot does not have a month and day of its own. It's connected to Passover. It's almost as if God's saying Passover and Shavuot are two parts of the same thing, separated by 49 days, separated from, by a time of travel from one redemption to the other. You kind of get the picture? We'll, we'll revisit this in a moment. But the first redemption takes place in Egypt on the day of Passover. But this redemption is described for us in the Torah portion that directly precedes Pentecost, Shavuot. It takes place at Sinai. In the first redemption, a lamb is the substitute. The lamb dies instead of the firstborn. In the second redemption, there's no death. A living Levite becomes the substitute for the living firstborn. In the first redemption, the blood of the lamb is put on the door of the home. You can put it on the door or on the lintels and doorpost. But in the second redemption, you have a Levite serving at the door of the tabernacle. How many times do you, do you see the phrase at the door of the tent of meeting? God would deal with them at the door of the tent of meeting. They're to stand at the door of the tent of meeting. It's kind of saying at the entrance to the tabernacle. And this is where the Levites serve. They would, they would erect it. And then the sons of Aaron would perform the sacrifices and the maintenance of it inside. And then the Levites would disassemble it when it was time to move. The first redemption is a life for a life. The life of the lamb is given up instead of the life of the firstborn son. But in the second redemption, it's service for service. You see, in ancient times, the firstborn son was given a double portion of the inheritance because he had several extra duties that the other sons uh, would not have. He would take care of mom and dad in their old age. That's maybe why our oldest son moved to the Middle East. I don't know. He, did. he, <laughs> he started looking old and he says, I'm out of here. But, uh, but he is coming home to visit on Wednesday. So we'll get to, we're looking forward to Wednesday night. We get to see Josh about once a year. And uh, we're really looking forward to his visit home. But the, the oldest son, the firstborn, would take care of mom and dad. But he would also be considered the priest of the home. You know, as the father would age, the oldest son would take on the job of the priest. Now, what is the job of a priest? 
I'm going to skip down to the bottom of the slide because this tells you Malachi 2, verses 6 and 7. Wonderful, wonderful passage. You know, we usually think of the priest as only performing sacrifices. But this is what it says in Malachi. It's talking about the Levites. As true instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips, he walked with me in shalom and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For his li the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of Adonai of hosts. No word of sacrifice there. You see, later on, when the, the priest community grew to such a size, they couldn't all serve in the temple at one time. So they would serve in the temple on a rotating schedule. So what were the rest of the priests doing when they were off duty? Well, they were never off duty. They were doing the things that Malachi talks about here. They would be examples of how to walk with God. Knowledge is something that would be coming from the lips. They're always teaching the Torah to others. They'd be turning people away from iniquity. They were always going around as just like the white blood cells in the body, just protecting and keeping healthy and protecting from any sinful influences that come in and, and building up and strengthening the people of God. And they had cities all through Israel. And so you were never too far from a priestly city where you go and you'd have contact with these priests. Now we are to be a kingdom of priests, aren't we? You wonder what that looks like? Malachi 2, verses 6 and 7. Does this describe you? Here's something to live up to. Let's read it in the first person and then ask ourselves, is this true of me? Each of us read this just in our own heart. I'll read it aloud. True instruction is in my mouth and no wrong is found on my lips. I walk with God in peace and uprightness and I turn many from iniquity. For my lips guard knowledge, and people seek instruction from my mouth, for I am a messenger of Adonai. Now there's something to aspire to as a kingdom of priests. Well, let's go back to where we left off. These two redemptions are two pictures of Messiah because everything speaks of him. And I wonder if when Yeshua rose on that, uh, on that morning and he joined those, those two men, those two disciples walking to Emmaus, and it says he, he alluded to all the things in the Torah and the, the prophets and, uh, that, uh, that applied to himself. I wonder if these two redemptions may not have been something that he discussed with them. I don't know. But the first redemption, the redemption in Egypt, Pictures Messiah as our Savior. They needed saved from death. They needed saved from slavery. And that lamb accomplished that. And Yeshua, our Passover lamb, who is crucified on Passover, accomplishes a full salvation for us. And churches do a good job of, of presenting this aspect of Messiah. Unfortunately, I think churches get maybe a, a D. D minus, D plus, when it comes to the other. Messiah, our mediator. Messiah, our priest. Because you see, this is not a death. This is a partnership. This is a living relationship that is maintained at all times. Because where did the priest get their food? Where did they get their money? Where did they get their housing? Where did they get their land? It was all donated to them was all given to them. Their physical welfare was completely dependent upon the love and the obedience of the rest of the tribes of Israel. They had no land of their own. They had no money of their own that they earned. They didn't do farming. They didn't involve themselves in the trade. Their full-time job was to do the things mentioned there in Malachi. And so the people of Israel supported them. Then what did the Levites do for the people of Israel? They disseminated the word of God. 
And this was an ongoing thing, day by day, month by month, year by year. And this is a partnership with Messiah. A mediator is one who connects God and man. And this is a relationship that must be maintained constantly. Go back to the Passover lamb for a second. And now you all know the answer to this. How many times was the blood of the Passover lamb applied to doors of Jewish homes? How many times in history? One time. One time only. Now, how many times in Jewish history were Passover lambs eaten? Year after year after year after year until the temple's destroyed. When the temple's rebuilt, it'll pick up again year after year after year after year. In other words, the blood of the lamb, one application was enough for all of history. But the body of the lamb, which is a picture of the word of God, it's something we do constantly over and over and over and over again. Because it was the body of the lamb that gave them strength to walk out of slavery. And I always have to bring this up. Do you know people? I do. They've applied the blood of Messiah to their lives. They've been passed from death to life, but they're still slaves in Egypt. That's no way to live. They know, they know about the blood of Messiah. They don't know how to apply the body of Messiah. They don't know how to feed upon it. And what did Yeshua say? My flesh is meat indeed. It's bread indeed. You have to feed upon it. So we feed upon the word of God. And that's what empowers us and strengthens us to walk out this life. Okay, question. Jim. Leaving Egypt uh, stresses one redemption in Mount Sinai. The second, mm -hmm. uh, today, only one redemption is needed, correct? No, don't confuse redemption with salvation. Okay, we, I know we tend to think redemption and salvation the same thing. Not the same thing. Um, well, now, first of all, they are connected. If there had been no redemption in Egypt, there certainly wouldn't be one <laughs> taking place later at Mount Sinai. But the first one is, remember, it's being passed from death to life. This makes you alive. You're not dead. Now, what do you do with this life? You live this life in relationship with God, and that requires constant daily application and practice. It's an ongoing thing. But the first real redemption, the number one that succumbed you to, to become obedient is the one and only needed one for a ticket to eternal life, right? Well, see, now you're, now you're talking like an evangelical. You see, see, even what we, the distortion that we often hear is that all that matters is going to heaven when I die instead of to hell. But that's not the gospel of the Bible. The gospel of the Bible is living in the kingdom of heaven beginning now. Heaven's a continuation. But I live it now. In other words, we... In evangelicalism, it's all about what Messiah has done for me, and it's all true. But now, I'm invited to be a living sacrifice to give myself to him. And that's what we don't hear much about. And that's what the second redemption is. Giving myself to him. Right. Every single day. Taking up my cross and following him daily. He took up his cross once to die for me. I'm invited to take mine up every single day to follow him. With uh, all due respect... You only get a message to where uh, one tries to get to heaven or to hell from an evangelical uh, person. Mm -hmm. Only if you run into one that's saying that. That's not mm -hmm. their overall message. Their message is a disciple of uh, I also. Well, I have a tract. <laughs> I forget where I came across this. I think somebody stuck it in something that belonged to me, and this is their idea of witnessing. And I picked it up because it's a typical track that I would pass out when I was growing up. And know what the title of this is? Are You Going to Heaven? And the whole track, the entire track, and the things it says are true, don't get me wrong, but the whole thing is about when I die, where do I go? The thing is, I'm hoping that death is still a long way away from me.
I want to know how do I live now? And that's what Sinai is about. This is the thing that has led me to Messianic Judaism. In other words, has led me to the religion of Messiah. Because I was secure in my eternal security. I knew where I was going when I died. That was not a fear to me. I knew because I knew the word of God. I, I knew that when I died, I would be absent of the bodies be present with him. Got it. I had no idea to live from now to then. Be nice and witness to people. Well, you know, being nice is a skill. There are sometimes I have to be hard because Yeshua was hard. How did he know when to be hard and when to be nice? And witness to people. Yeah, I could tell them the gospel, but if they watch my life when I wasn't talking about the gospel, it was a bad witness. Because I did not know how to live life. And the, and the reason is, is because the New Testament keeps pointing me back to the Torah. And I couldn't see that. My, I was blinded to that. Paul says, be a doer, or James says, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. The only word James had was the Old Testament, the Torah in particular. Be a doer of that, James says. I wasn't a doer of that. I thought it was done, done away with. Paul says, study to show yourselves uh, approved unto God. Workmen who do not need to be ashamed. Well, I thought that applied to New Testament, but there's no New Testament when Paul wrote that. He's referring to the Torah. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. There was no New Testament when Paul wrote that. All scripture, the Old Testament, Torah in particular, which is the foundation, and it's profitable for my doctrine. I was told not to go there for my doctrine. For my reproof, to show me what's wrong in my life. I was told, don't go there to find out what's wrong. For correction, by all means, don't try to correct yourself the Old Testament. And your instruction in righteousness, no, that's done away. You see? So... I, I mean, but I'm rehashing things everybody here knows. So we're going to move on, or else we're not going to be getting out of the gym by two over there. So. <laughs> All right, let's go a bit further. Do you see already how this, these two redemptions are tying together to the two Shavuot? The first one and the second one? We'll get that a little bit more as we go. Messiah's redemption for us. You know, just like the Lamb's redemption for Israel was a one-time accomplishment. They never had to be set free from Egypt again, historically. One time, that was it. They never went back. And in our own lives, individually, that one-time redemption through the blood of Messiah. One time, don't need it a second time. But oh my goodness, this knowing my Messiah is mediator, knowing my Messiah is the doors, the one who connects me with God is an it's an ongoing maintenance. It's like a wedding. Robin and I got married one time, almost 33 years ago. We've never had to get married again. But the marriage is an everyday maintenance. That relationship is, is, is something that's ongoing. You don't walk your bride up to the aisle, you know, and you get married and say, hey, see ya, maybe we can get together sometime next week. <laughs> we'll get together every Sunday morning for breakfast. How's that? You know, or every Sabbath morning. It's a daily thing. You've made a life together and you maintain that life daily. And we live it out because I'm not a single man anymore. I'm a married man. My entire life has changed. It's wonderful. But it's better to be a single man than to be a half married one. And I've always said the only thing more miserable than an unredeemed person is a half redeemed person. Because I've known people who are, who are non-believers and they were somewhat content in their lives. When they became believers but did not live it out daily, they were miserable. Absolutely miserable. I've been there. I know what that's like. Adam, see your hand up. Adam, actually the uh, person that has the leprosy that's not, it's not full on leprosy, it's that's a good question. Is it is the peril of the leper? I have to think about that. I don't want to answer that one off the top of my head. Um, I think it's a little different because the leprosy is a disease. This is a, a relationship we're talking about here, but there's everything's connected in some way. Yeah, yeah, it might be. I have to think about that. The first redemption is about exit from Egypt. 
The second redemption is about entrance to Canaan. Because here in Numbers is the launch from Mount Sinai to Canaan. They're ready. All systems are go. Everything's A-OK. We're prepared for launch. And they're off and ready to go. Remember, Canaan is not a picture of life after death. Canaan is a picture of the fruitful, redeemed life. It's a picture of the fruitful, redeemed life, a mature life, where God is so intimately involved in your everyday existence that it seems like one existence rather than two. You know, when they're walking in Canaan, Every day there's a cloud overhead. Every night there's fire. They went into Canaan. That didn't happen anymore. Every day in the wilderness, they get up in the morning, six days a week at least, there's manna all over the ground to eat. When they cross Jordan into Canaan, no more manna. For those 40 years they were in the wilderness, that rock, it says, it followed them and provided water. When they go over Jordan into Canaan, no more rock. Does that mean the supernatural came to an end? And over here, you know, what was here in the wilderness, it came to an end and now there's no supernatural? No. In the wilderness, the supernatural and the physical were clearly separated into two things. When they go into Canaan, it looks like one thing. Not because God's gone away, but his relationship has become so intimate, so intimate that only the one walking with him really sees how close he is. You understand? That's Canaan. I know for young believers, they can be so excited because I tell you, you want to see a miraculous answer to prayer, get some brand new young believer to pray and pow, God will just answer in these amazing, incredible ways. It's, it's, there's nothing like it. But what happens, we want to hold on to that to where we see the miraculous. We see it, the supernatural kind of out there in front of us all the time. God saying, no, 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 I'm going to move in with you. I want my life and yours to be so intimately intertwined that no one can tell them apart. And that's what Canaan's all about. It's just as miraculous. It's just not so much to the physical eyes. But oh my goodness, the eyes of the heart, it's so much better than the wilderness any day of the week. I think sometimes we can fail to see just how supernatural the normal redeemed life is. So, this first redemption is described for us four times. It's in the Gospels. The second redemption about our priest and how we are to be priests, described for us in the book of Hebrews. Very tough book, by the way. And, uh, but that's what it's about. Now, let's understand something. Yeshua is the Passover lamb. We're not. Yeshua is the high priest. We're not. But with that said, we are to be imitators of him. And in many ways, we also become the sheep of his hand. And there, in many ways, our love can cover the multitude of sins. In many ways, we may be led as sheep to the slaughter, as he was. And can our death be like his? Not necessarily that we're tortured to death, but can we go quietly? When people persecute us, when people want to to literally nail us down, can we go through with grace, as he did, without whining? without complaining, without realizing this is the way they treated my master. Should I be surprised if this is the way they treat his followers? He told us not to be surprised if they don't treat us any better than they treated him. He's the high priest. We're not. And yet we are a kingdom of priests. We are to imitate him. He's the only mediator between God and man. But we also stand in a place where we can introduce men to God. And we can clarify the relationship of a man with his creator, with his, with his savior, right? So, there's only one Passover lamb, only one high priest, and that's our Messiah. But we can imitate those things and should be, those are models for us. We could never take his place, but we should be like him. You understand? 
We're to be little images. That's what the word Christian, Christian means. A Christian is a little Christ. Christ means, is, means Messiah. We're to be like little messiahs, little model messiahs. There's only one the Messiah. But nobody can replace him. But we were to imitate him and model him and reflect him in his ways as best we can. And then as a group, we can do that so much better as a community. Yes, Dennis. Would you explain the picture of the Dale Slaves? The Dale Slaves were the Jewish people. Yeah. That's a great question. Okay, the the veil. Okay, now I'm going to go over time, but see, we get to blame it on Dennis, not me. That's I like this. I like this. This is a good setup. <laughs> All right, um, I, I think this will be worth it, and then we'll, we'll skedaddle. Uh, Dennis was asking me about the veil, uh, or bringing up the veil about how it was torn, and um, kind of how that pictures Messiah and so on. Uh, I wasn't sure if I use this slide. I put it together. And um, I, I just took some images off Google. I Googled Ark of the Covenant, and I just grabbed three images off there. Now, each one of these images has a glaring error, a glaring error. And had you lived a couple thousand years ago in, in the wilderness, uh, 1,500 years ago, you'd look at these pictures and say, oh, those are dead wrong. A glaring error. Now, you might say, well, the, the staves are going through the wrong way. Uh, the staves should be parallel with the ends of the ark and not with the sides of the ark. Okay, yeah, that's not glaring. Yeah, that's a mistake. What's the glaring, glaring, glaring error that you should all immediately notice? I mean, just a little quick glance. Oh, that's so wrong. What have we got? Yes, ma'am. There you go. There's no cover over the ark. You never carried the ark without it covered. Ever. You were not allowed to glance at the ark. You're allowed to look at it. And that is found in this week's Torah portion. Go to chapter 4. Verse 5. Numbers 4, 5. When the camp is to journey, Aaron and the son shall come and take down the parachet, the partition cover. That's the cover between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. That curtain would come down. This is the curtain that was torn in two that Dennis is referring to. Take down the partition cover and cover the Ark of the Testimony with it. Then they shall place upon it a tachash hide covering. We have no idea what a tachash hide is. And then spread a cloth entirely of turquoise, turquoise wool over it, to kill it. And then adjust its staves. And um, it goes on to explain that you never look at the ark, and yet all these pictures, and I could have shown you probably another half a dozen or so that look like this. I found one, maybe two, that showed the blue cover over it. So, when the ark journeyed, they took that veil, laid it over the ark. It concealed the ark. That veil, the writer of Hebrews tells us, is a picture of the flesh of Messiah. The flesh of Messiah concealed the essence of who is really at home in that body. People look at the flesh, it was just flesh. You know, can you imagine? Okay, picture this now covered. And you're standing there with, with somebody, you say, Oh, look, there goes the Ark of the Covenant. The other look says, Well, I don't see any Ark, I see a pile of laundry. <laughs> no, that's the Ark, it's under there, it's really under there. Well, prove it. Oh, you can't look. It can't be revealed. I don't believe there's any ark. I don't believe God's presence, this golden box that contained his, his mercy seat. I don't believe it's under it. All I see is laundry. You'll never convince such a person that the ark is really there. The only way they'll know is by reading the Torah. This is how you can have a conversation with somebody. Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Redeemer of the world. Well, I don't see it. Okay, So, when Yeshua dies, 
When the body and the soul separate, what happens to the veil in the temple? It's torn in half from top to bottom. It separates. So we have access through that, through the veil. That way of access is made open through the death of Messiah, through the tearing of his body. And now that division, that thing that, that cut us off from the tree of life. This is our two cherubim at the entrance of the garden, blocking the tree of life. There are cherubim on the veil. It's torn. The cherubim step aside. And now the tree of life is open. All who want to come, to come and eat. What, a, what an amazing picture. Ah, this is why I go over time. All right. We've got to, to, to close now. I know there are probably more questions and comments, but we'll talk more when we go into the Owen Egg Room. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Lord, your word is so rich. There's so much we can talk about. And Father, we know that your Torah is eternal because it will take that long to discuss all of it. But in the meantime, I pray that we will have been fed this morning and that we will find that your word is is truly, truly our nourishment. So Lord, help us to think about the things we've, we've talked about and read and the things we didn't have time for. And throughout the week, may these things continue to come back to our minds. But Lord, I pray that all of those who have been touched by Yeshua, who have been passed from death to life and slavery to freedom, might learn to walk daily and true intimacy with you. For then we will be lights of the world. We will be a testimony to the earth. So Father, may we truly live that out every day of our lives, every moment of the day. And this we will do with your help. For we have the two things you gave on two different Shavuot's. We have your Torah and we have your spirit. Lord, what more could we need? So we say thank you, thank you, in the name of Yeshua. Amen.